So this is We Insist, Speaking Truth to Power, a conversation with musicians who work on and off the bandstand for social change and activism. And of course, in that title, I lifted from a Max Roach album and a Max Roach suite. Um, so I'm honoring that. Um, that recording was produced by Nat Hentoff, a writer and a thinker who was one of my mentors and someone who was very generous, please feel free, someone who was very generous with me. Um, I had the luxury and the honor of being in the same pages of the Village Voice as he was, writing in one space about culture and politics together. Um, and Nat was the person who helped open the door for me to write for the Wall Street Journal, which we thought it was kind of funny that he and I were paid by Rupert Murdoch. Um, for, for me, you know, th this, I, this conversation is one of many conversations that I have with these musicians and other musicians and other people. Um, with the premise that are, you know, the, the things we care about, the things we speak up about, the things we speak out about, the things that maybe we are a engage in activism around, um, are of one piece with the music and culture that we experience. And it has always been so, and will always be so, but what does that really mean? So sitting next to me to my left, Samora Pinderhues grew up in the Bay Area. He came to New York, attended Juilliard, where, among other people, he studied with Kenny Barron and Kendall Briggs. New York is also where he met his artistic mentor, the playwright Anna Devere Smith. He's a composer, pianist, vocalist, known for multidisciplinary projects and for his use of music to examine socio-political issues. And um, last time he and I got together was up in Cambridge. He splits his time between here and there now and Harvard, pursuing a PhD in the Creative Practice and Critical Inquiry Program created by Vijay Iyer there. Um, Mark Ribot, next to him, grew up in Newark, New Jersey. As a teenager, he played in various garage bands while studying with his mentor, Haitian classical guitarist and composer, Franz Cassius? Cassius. Cassius, thank you. Uh, you know, his, I could go on a, very long with Mark's resume. I will tell you that it includes Elvis Costello, Caetano Veloso, McCoy Tyner, who we were just talking about, Elton John, John Zorn, He's also one of the architects of the gorgeous weirdness of Tom Waits' Rain Dogs album. Um, and I most recently wrote about Mark for a wonderful album that he did in 2018 called Songs of Resistance, 1942 to 2018, and that's one of the things I think we'll talk about. Next to Mark is Regina Carter, who was born in Detroit, and my, like my son Sam, she began studying Suzuki violin at the age of four. Um, I don't know where Sam will end up, but <laughs> Regina has ended up as a distinguished player, composer, band leader, recipient of the MacArthur Genius Award, the Doris Duke Artist Award, and um, she works very widely as an educator, including as the artistic director across the river of the New Jersey Performing Arts All-Female Jazz Residency which has now been renamed in honor of Jerry Allen as the Jerry Allen Jazz Camp. Oh. Um, so we're here to talk about speaking truth to power in all its manifestations. And maybe I thought one way we could start is to talk about specific projects and specific expressions of that. And, um, Samora, can you talk a little bit about the Healing Project and what that is and where it's taken you? Sure. Um, I'm honored to be here. Thank you for inviting me. I'm honored to be with these two amazing people that I, I really admire a lot and um, to be a part of this uh, whole set of discussions. Um, as far as the project that you're referring to, the Healing Project, um, this is one of my new projects, so it's very much of a work in progress, um, but uh, it came out of um, really trying to understand uh, my, my way into my father's work. This is the only way for me to start it. Um, my dad is um, one of the primary um, organizers and also kind of um, 
community and policy activist around uh, youth violence prevention. Um, and he studies community trauma. And a lot of times um, when we talk about policing, we talk about mass incarceration, we talk about violence, we're not linking those things together. And one of the things that his work does is that um, he shows how, number one, how prevention works, how over-policing leads to more violence as well as to police brutality um, and, sur and over-surveilled communities and a whole set of, of issues. But he also shows how prevention works and how a key part of prevention is healing, which is a lot of times what ends up getting lost in the sauce because it's less provable when you're working with a lot of policy people and things like that, it's a lot easier to, to talk about jobs and to talk about, I mean, a lot, you know, things that are very important, jobs, gun control, um, you know, things like that, education. But healing is something that's harder to define, but is probably the most important piece. Um, and so for me, this project was a way to uh, approach that as an artist. Um, so what, I, what I've done is um, I spent the last year and a half going around the country speaking to people of all different ages, um, all different backgrounds, who have dealt with either uh, violence, incarceration, detention, or over-policing, police brutality, about their experiences with trauma, but also, very importantly, about their experiences with healing, and particularly about the ways that they've been able to find and create healing spaces and opportunities outside of systems because a lot of times the systems are the ones that are oppressing and, and creating the violence and the trauma. So for those systems to then come back and say, oh, we're going to be reformist and we're gonna provide you with programs that are gonna heal you, it's just not working out that way. Mm -hmm. So um, for me, this project is a way to uh, create these intra-community inter conversations on how we can um, understand ways to heal and then hopefully build those spaces. Um, and it'll be a music project, an album, but also will be a physical installation that will travel. In, you know. So how creatively, how do you, how does that happen? In other words, how does whatever you're doing as you visit these communities and these prisons, how does that translate into the art itself? Are you using interviews and the actual sounds and the voices? Are you telling stories? Are you, yeah, I mean, I, I am using the actual voices both as the narrative material but also as melodic material. But I'm, I'm always a little bit loath to talk about process because it's always changing. Um, so, so I think it will be very complicated. I think what I'm really concerned with now is that a lot of projects, two different things, and I'll try to make this short, but number one, there are a lot of projects where artists come in with really good intentions and are really looking to make very important statements, but then they don't think about the ways that they present them. And they end up making these statements about people who are being oppressed or about poverty or about you know, any type of situations to very rich people with enough money to go to a concert hall. Mm -hmm. um, and so the biggest thing for me, number one, is to make sure that this project has multiple ways to be accessible to speak first to the people that it's about, and then also to have other versions for people who need to be in my opinion woken up to these kind of things and to and to really understand what's the rub in terms of why they're not understanding what it is. Um, the other the other thing is to find all the opportunities through this process, which for me is, you know, me meeting a lot of new people, talking to them about very vulnerable things, me getting very vulnerable about my, about my experiences, but I don't want it to just be about uh, to just stay there. So I'm trying to find all the ways that I can um, use this process not just as a generative process uh, for me, but as a generative process for the community that I'm building through, through the project. So one example of that is that the album will be uh, generative in, in, con in process with all the interviewees, which I don't, interview is not, a, it's really conversations because I'm giving it myself too, but with everyone who I'm speaking with, whether they're artists or not artists, because um, I think that everyone is an artist, everyone has something to say, especially these folks. But, um, and another, another way is that, based on what I learned as I go along, I'm trying to uh, apply that as time, uh, like more immediately. So one example is I have a, a commission coming up that I have to present a set of shows, and I wasn't sure what I was gonna do for that. And I, I went to Arizona as a part of these, uh, as part of this healing project process and I visited detention centers 
in Arizona with uh, talk to some folks that were trying to apply for asylum and we're just stuck in these the are the ice detention centers for yes there's a little bit of difference around and i think a lot of people don't really know the difference between people who are applying for asylum and but that's a whole nother conversation but the main thing to understand is that because these folks are not technically citizens they are not granted public defenders they're not granted right. defense of any kind um, and most of them don't speak english and as a result they have to defend themselves in court and they can't read the documents. And it becomes a very, very, very capitalist uh, take advantage of system because all these lawyers who know that this is the case will come in and say, pay me $10,000 to take your case and then they'll know that it's, they're gonna lose. So hmm. what we're doing with this set of shows is there's a, pro a project called the Florence Project in Arizona. They're the only project in Arizona that provides free legal counsel. And they're very small, and they have basically, you know, not enough funding. So, anyways, we're using these shows to to fundraise for that organization, and these are just the small things that you know I feel like we all can do as we're moving through, even as we're working on larger projects, as we're moved by different things, and we see the need. Mm -hmm. Whatever tools we have, you know, we have to provide. Thanks, um, Mark. I know when we talked a while ago, I guess your own political activism began in second grade. <laughs> right? They they can't they canceled the soupy sales TV that show. Was, that was the first protest march. <laughs> that was um, and I have injustice. <laughs> I've uh, I've followed you know I followed your music and your career since and I know that the your own activism and your own political consciousness has never been separate from your artistry. But but I was really moved by that 2018 project and album for which you mined older songs and created new songs, um, songs of resistance. Can you talk a little bit about what inspired, well, I mean, I remember we did talk about that and you were talking a little bit what about being in a women's <laughs> march. Yeah, yeah. And talking about an idea of music's role for this moment. Yeah. yeah. How, how, so I, how, what led to the creation of that project? Well, I mean, what, what led to it in the, in the short run was that, you know, I, um, I, you know, like everybody else, woke up and saw that Donald Trump was president. And I said, oh, no, it was a disaster on many levels. But um, one of the many levels in which it was a disaster was that, like, I was almost finished with this record that, I was gonna do with my band, uh, Ceramic Dog, and all of a sudden, you know, I realized, no, that's not what I wanna do right. I mean, I realized the world was gonna have to wait to have like another record of me complaining about my girlfriend. <laughs> you know, like <laughs> that we had more important things that we had to do. Well, not really more important. I mean, like I got, it. <laughs> it's all still there, you know. <laughs> um, but, uh, but that there were other, that I felt a need to do something, to, to make a record that addressed what everybody was thinking. It's not like I said, oh, I want to make a, uh, I want to make a political record. I want to rock the house, okay? But sometimes before you rock the, or in order to rock the house, you have to acknowledge the giant elephant in the corner of the room. You have to be honest with people and say, if everybody's nervous about something, if everyone's upset, you have to be honest about what that is and you have to address it. So that's what those songs came out of. And the way I addressed it politically and musically, um, I guess I, a lot of musicians think in the same way. You know, People talk about musical progress, but what many of the musicians I know do is we research the past. We listen, you know, when, when I hear something I dig, I want to know where it comes from. I want to know, you know, who, who are the side men, who they played with before, you know, or side women, um, who they played with before. You know, I researched the past. So I wanted to do that with, um, I, I'd already been interested in songs of resistance, both protest songs and songs of resistance, two different things, a detail that people don't often comment on, but. A protest, protest recognizes the uh, authority it's, address, it's protesting to. Resistance does not. And so this was Songs of Resistance. Um, uh, so I'd long been interested in, in you know, research songs um, that 
came, well, they came, some that were protests, I guess it came out of the black civil rights movement, but also the uh, World War II resistance against fascism and earlier, earlier uh, periods in American history. So I wanted to do that, but I wanted to do them in a way that made sense now. I didn't want to do archival recordings of them. So mm -hmm. that's how that record came about. And the other reason that it came about was I went on a lot of marches. Um, you know, I'm sure a lot of people did. And the thing is, is that it was really kind of boring because everybody says the same two or three words over and over again. It's all right for a little while, but I wound up wishing that people had a song to sing. I mean, people used to, in the movements that really made things happen, people had a common song, some common songs, and I started to see the fact that there was no common song really in Occupy or in the Women's March um, as kind of an analog, not really a cause, but maybe analogous to political problems. We, so anyways, I record all these tunes and we put it out and that's. Yeah, I, I, you know, I've, I also participated in marches and one of the realizations I had was as much as I felt that energy and I felt good about that in mass, I thought there are a lot of people here and we all have particular things that we care about and they need specific discussion, specific action. It's like one thing I've been doing over at the Jazz Museum in Harlem is this ongoing series, I know both Samora and Mark have participated in, I may yet get Regina, where I try to put together, there's a musical performance and then we have a discussion. So when I did one with Samora, after the music we talked with someone who had serve time and now works in a, empowering other people um, who are coming out of jails and prisons. And yeah, so I, I realize that maybe there's ways that music connects to these things and each slice can be considered with its own consciousness. But before we move along, can you talk uh, just for a, a little bit about that song, Sereni Vas, and how and why it came oh, about? Oh yeah, that tune, uh, it's a tune uh, called Srinivá Kuchibatla, and in the first few months of Trump's presidency, there was a, well, and still is, an, a, an increase in um, racist and anti-Semitic and anti-immigrant violence. And one of the first people murdered in that wave right after Trump was elected was a, a an, an immigrant called Srinivá Kuchibatla. I think he was a, a Sikh. Mm -hmm. But um, some idiot thought that he was a, thought he was a Muslim and decided to kill him and did, and so like basically, you know when I basically the tune is more or less the news the news item made to rhyme, um, and I yeah, and I just felt like you know that guy should have a song you know. Yeah, I mean, one thing that struck me about the album was, you know, you really did put together, okay, here's a 70-year-old song of resistance from an ocean away, and then right next to a song that really at the moment was ripped from the headlines here. Um, Regina, you know, when you, I, 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 if I may say, when, when you first, when I first became of your, aware of your career and your music, I sort of felt like you're very, presence with your instrument, making the musical decisions you were making and playing the music you were making was in its way a little bit of a political act um, and mining a history uh, for your instrument that maybe at that moment wasn't that acknowledged. Um, does, that, does that make sense? Yeah, definitely. Um, and I know that now you're embarked on a couple of different projects that are more overtly taking up issues and causes, and maybe you can talk a little bit. Did one, one, did one grow out of the inspiration of Karen Allison's project? Or one did, yeah. Do you want to talk a little bit about that and how it connects to what you're planning for this year? Um, it's a folding rights project, and uh, one thing I was, I was shocked by, especially the last election, is how many people didn't vote. 
And as an uh, as a African American woman like growing up in Detroit in the '60s, my parents would always sit us in front of that black and white TV in the living room, and we would see the marches and seeing people have dogs sicked on them or hoses, um, and being beaten. And so, and mm -hmm. she, my parents always said, "You have to vote these because of what these people have gone through. You always have to vote." Um, of course, when I was growing up, you kept your political views to yourself. Um, mm -hmm. But now, with, of course, social media and everything, everybody ha feels, feels the, um, anyway, it's just public discussion. But I was really shocked at how many people feel like their vote didn't count. And it was important for me to know that even if you don't, you don't you're not for either any of the candidates, just the fact that you're going to that ballot box because someone was beaten or killed or hosed in order for you to be able to do that is incredibly important and especially for African Americans and for women. Um, and I see with um, a lot of young people, you, you know, I, sorry, I'm all over the place. I used to grow up thinking I'm so I'm so thankful that I didn't have to go through any of that, that you know, my grandparents or my parents went through. And all of a sudden I woke up and here we are again. And um, yeah. it's really scary. And the thing is, is, you know, people, I live in an area now, uh, we moved to this little area in Jersey and all of our neighbors really help each other. We snow blow each other's property, rake the lawns, blah, blah, blah. And then when the last election was coming up, I saw where we lived and it was a little scary for me because there was so much negative uh, killings and, and just people coming out of their mouths with anything and saying, and just so much, you know, the racists were coming out from under the rocks. And it's interesting though to talk to my neighbors and to be able to have civilized conversations with them about our differences and to be able to hear each other. And I think that's so incredibly important because a lot of times we've become so divided. We've become Republicans against Democrats and we're neither. Right. We're humans. And we have to we have to learn to hear each other. You know, people are willing when I think I would ask my neighbors sometimes like who you vote for is your business, but how could you vote for someone that is is so such a blatant racist um some of the ugly things they said about women you know don't you think about you know or taking you know trying to reverse just this whole trying to reverse the rights of women with our and so the thing is is that i found that a lot of people they have the one thing that they want mm -hmm. that they believe in that's theirs that they don't want you to they obama's taking away our bullets or which my neighbor told us next door, so he was making his own bullets. Um, or, nice. yeah, or, um, you know, or someone who doesn't believe in, a, in, a, in abortion. And that should be a woman's right, no one else's right. But if they, if they see that the politician is, is, for, is against abortion, they don't care what else. So they're putting on blinders, and they're not seeing how, they're not hearing how these decisions affect other people, nor are they caring. So I think it's 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 crucial that we try and have these conversations. But it, we're at a really dangerous point where we can't. It's like it's like a caveman mentality to to just let's fight, let's fight. Yeah, and you. you I mean, I, uh, it's important what you said about that stiffening divide, which I think we can probably all agree that social media and digital revolution has served to intensify. Do you feel like what you do as artists, and what I do as someone who's invested in the world of culture and arts, is it a way to, to, um, to counter that, that divide, that balkanization? Is it a way for us to reach people that isn't already here or here? I, I think it is, you know? Um, I think because, at least for me, when I'm playing music, it's not an agenda to try and make someone believe that how I believe. It's just to present material, music, interviews that help us all to see what's in front of us and that we don't want to talk about. You talked about the elephant in the room, you know, until we, we, until we deal with that elephant, 
the things are just going to get uglier and uglier. Go ahead. Sorry, I was, Go ahead, man. I was really glad, you know, um, I, I just want to address something because you've been talking about activism. And I'm really glad to hear that you talk like an organizer. <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's a great essay by Astra Taylor, a writer, uh, uh, called Against Activism. Mm -hmm. And she noted that, you know, like, she noted that this is a word that's come up recently. Right. That it wasn't particularly a word that people used during the most effective times of political action. People were organizers. And that involves exactly what you're talking about. Talk about talking, talking to your, talking to the, the, the neighbors, try to engage people either in a community, either neighbors or co-workers or uh, tenants in the same building, whatever it is. Right, and you also, Regine also said the word human, and there is on a very deep level of the word humanism, and what can we actually share and be invested in as all human beings. Samora, uh, can you talk, I knew, in the, can you talk a little bit about why you were attracted to Anna Devere Smith's work and what that taught you in terms of using arts and using even performance as a means to deal with these things? Sure, yeah, before that, I'd just like to respond because I think I have a little bit of a different approach. Okay. I do agree, I do agree so I don't want to say that, but I think my biggest thing is that my, my personal analysis of, and I, I, I like that you brought up the concept of, of organizing, of course, um, the, my personal analysis is not that we need uh, is not that the issue we have, or the primary issue uh, I that we have is because we are more divided or because we are not speaking to each other or not here. I do agree we have to listen, but I don't think that's the reason why we're here. I think number one, we've always been divided. That's why some of us knew that Trump was going to win that first time. Um, I also think that we were out organized. We were out organized and we're, we're still being out organized. They've, they're yep. way <clears throat> steps ahead of us on climate change, on immigration, on policing. They are way, way, way ahead. And I think we spend a lot of time, I'm using the royal we, I know that's a little bit vague, but mm -hmm. I think you know what I mean. We spend a lot of time talking about uh, how to convince people to, to be with us when in reality, we have the folks that we need, we just are not organized well enough. I mean, when you look at something like gerrymandering, for instance, that's the reason we lost the election, you know? Yep. So, so when you look at those things, you're realizing, okay, this is what we need to actually get organized around, you know? I think one thing that makes me very hopeful is that with young people, with my generation, I'm seeing people not just vote, because voting is so important and, and it's so, it was so key I think this time around that people are not, they're not just saying or having the mindset, oh, we just have to vote because it's a, a matter of process. They're really thinking about why they have to vote. Well, and that's I think, important yeah, too. Yeah, 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 it's exactly what you're saying it, within, in terms of the historical context, but also we're thinking about how to put forth our own candidates. We're not choosing, we're not just voting. We're thinking about who are we gonna put in positions of power or are we gonna step up in right. positions of power and say, we will take this seat, you know? And then we can help, we can, we can actually vote for people we believe in. Sorry, I know that was an aside. But in terms of Anna's work, um, I think Anna, uh, what, what I've, I mean, the biggest thing I learned from her work was the music, she really listens to the musicality of language, which is interesting because I had never thought about that in that way uh, until I, connected with her and she's you know she was my only non-musical primary mentor and I think all my other mentors definitely understood that but she was the first one to be able to translate that to me um, and I think she also um, is all about um, process in the sense of uh, let's actually go beyond what's easy you know, so I think for me that was the other thing that I've really learned from her is to like really, really not stop at what's easy, whether that's with your own process, whether that's with the, the imagination that it requires for us to move beyond where we are now, any of that kind of stuff. And I mean, I imagine that there's just the sheer political force of 
her presence in her career must have had some impact on. I mean, to me, it's like even if you just follow her acting career and her theatrical career, it's almost like a Harry Belafonte type presence where you would have to understand where this person stands. Yeah, I mean, I don't. It's hard for me to tell because she's like my aunt. You right. know what I mean? <laughs> but, um, but, but yes, she she's definitely been a beacon, a, a guiding light for me in many different respects. Regina, you were going to say something. I was going to say because um, I worked with Anna year, many years ago on a project, yeah. and just watching um, her going, at watching her work is something. It's entertaining. And something that you might laugh at that she does, it might be an imitation or something, but then it's so heavy, you realize after you laugh or, or the, you, you realize what she's saying, the importance and the heaviness of what she's bringing to the table. And I think it's, it, it hits you so hard. It's not just in your face, but the way, the way she presents it ha has a powerful impact once you witness it. Yeah. Um, one thing I'm hoping doesn't get lost is, you know, all these specific issues are intimately connected and in the sources of what we need to address. Like, for instance, when you talk about the prison system and how certain people end up there and how certain people end up being felons, well, depending on what state you live in, that whole course of events may lead to you not having the right to vote in Florida or somewhere else. And if we trace back, well, how did you, what actually caused you to have this status where you cannot vote? That's a really amazing, I'll say something really quick. In that very specific instance, one of the things that Republicans are the most afraid of right now is that in the last midterm election cycle, that um, formerly incarcerated people won the right to vote in Florida. Yes, that change has and happened in Florida. And that's seven million new voters. So it is, it's, those kind of things are huge. Yep. Right, and we needn't, you know, we needn't tiptoe around the issue. The people who are in prison are structurally are black people and poor people. Yep. It's not, you know, it's, it's not a mystery. But I wanna, I wanna go back to something because I, I think it's very important that what you're talking about not simply showing up to vote, but developing an analysis and, and for, to seek political empowerment for the communities themselves, including young people. I think that's very important, but I think something also needs to be clarified. Um, because when we use the we for that, there's a lot of we's mm -hmm. yeah. happening here. And, uh, you know, and I, and I need to address this because I've heard this from musicians, okay? In other words, that one of the impetus, part of the impetus, and my choice of material in the um, in the songs resistance record was, I know a lot of left tunes, I know a lot of you know revolutionary tunes from from the labor movement, et cetera, and they didn't really make it on record because the politics of this to of the record and the politics of who the we needs to be is. Uh, just like looking to music, earlier music, as a blueprint and an inspiration for how to come together now. I look towards earlier politics, and we are facing a fascist threat, and the last time uh, a serious fascist threat was faced down during World War II, it was faced down by a politics, it was faced down by a politics of, of unity, um, a, 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 popular front against fascism. And so when the reason I want to be you know, careful to distinguish here is that, um, I mean, I'm, I'm going to vote for whatever. If, if the Democrats nominate a French poodle, I'm going to vote for that French poodle, <laughs> even, though, even though I'm going to continue to have my analysis. You know, in other words, I want to be, I think we need a popular front. We need, we need you, you said something very true, that we are being out-organized. And part of organizing involves thinking strategically. And we, gotta, and we gotta not think, oh, this one gets where we're going. No, we think this one gets it's the place from which we might possibly get closer to where we're going. Right. And unfortunately, that's, that, that's the situation. I, I find it important for, for myself to be able to have conversations with people that are that think differently than myself and voted differently than I do, um, 
just to really be able to hear why, what they're thinking. It's important for me to hear them and to hear, and, and it's not, I think we've gotten into, like I said, I'm right, you're wrong. And we have to hear each other to understand what our concerns are. Um, and I don't know, I don't know how that happens. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's, I, I'm, I'm glad that I, I found people in my in my area that I can have those conversations yeah. with. Yeah, uh, I, I mean, I think Eddie. part of it is personalizing it. I mean, when Mark Rubo has a song that's about a specific human being who was targeted, and we won't just say Sikhs or Muslims, we'll say here is a person and they died. I know I just did a piece for Chamber Music Magazine of all places where I interviewed Arturo Farrell and Antonio Sanchez, two very, you know, distinguished musicians, and one could talk about what it felt like to grow up in Mexico, move here as a college student, and hear the leading presidential candidate say that Mexicans are rapists and gang members. The other one could talk about being born in Mexico of Cuban descent and move here when he was a very young child, and what that moment felt like. What did it actually feel like for that person who is a well-known member of society, um, is, you know, I'll, I'll never forget, I remember not long after 9-11 and the Iraq war started, I talked to Dee Dee Bridgewater, and she was living in France at the time, and she played the blue note, and she spoke out against the war, and she told me that her manager called her the next morning. Do you intend to perform in the United States anymore? Do you like playing clubs in the United States? And I know a whole, there's a whole generation of jazz musicians who, that I know that came up in a time when record labels were investing in jazz again, but you needed to dress correct. You could honor Max Roach's rhythms, but you couldn't necessarily honor Max Roach's urge to say, we insist. I mean, I know this from speaking to them and interviewing them. Do you, have you have you three, either in terms of advice you're given in careers or experiences with presenters or audiences, have you had any chilling effect or backlash regarding the things you're talking about now in a way that you care to talk about? No, I, I haven't, only because I'm, I'm not coming, I'm not presenting that I'm right and you're wrong or you have to believe this way. It's just... Trying to trying to hear, trying to listen. Right. So. Well, um, I haven't suffered. I, I mean, this this could use a little bit of uh, a speaking <clears throat> speaking truth, not necessarily to our to power, but to some of our own mythologies. Mm -hmm. I have not uh, suffered. The only time I suffered a, a real serious chilling outright repression of, of political speech was when I played in, <laughs> I, I, I played in uh, Beijing and uh, at the Blue Note in, in Beijing. And um, they asked us to submit the tunes we're doing. We had, and then they said, oh, it has words. We had to submit the lyrics. And they said, oh, you can't play here. And because uh, <laughs> the lyrics were very political, you know, like we had all kinds of stuff. And also they didn't like that I used dirty words. One of the, one of the songs was called Fuck La Migra, you know, and there's a whole lot of stuff there that they didn't like. So then my manager, bless her, um, just said, oh, well, we won't do that. And then she gave him a bunch of instrumental stuff. So then we went over there. So <laughs> then, of course, when I was there, I did what I wanted anyways. For all I know, the club <laughs> owner's in jail being tortured right now. But, uh, and, um, but so there's been, not only has, have I not been repressed, we got to look at the irony of this because, you know, people say, oh, it's great you did this political music. Musicians are very, tend to be very careful. You know, if, when you have um, radical political mu musicians, they're playing to radical political or audiences. It's not as much of, it's not as much of a risk as it looks like. I don't think I lost that many, I don't think I lost that many, I don't think I had that many Trump supporters before. So I, I you know, I mean, all five of them, you know, didn't buy my record, you know, uh, but other people dug me. So I think the, th the places where I have seen, the places where it gets difficult 
you know, there's this language of empowerment and, and revolution and, and change. Where it gets difficult is when you try to unionize your own um, colleagues. When you try to deal, you know, there's, the, there's what we say, and then there's what we are and what we do. And there's a lot of people I've seen, you know, aesthetically and politically radical musicians groveling at the feet of a person who has the power over the ability to give them a gig. Right. Like, I mean, it's like really unbelievable and terrified of saying no and enduring verbal abuse and enduring lousy treatment. So, you know, that's, that's where I've seen, that's, I've seen more internal repression on that level than I have overt political repression. Did you want to speak to that? Or? Um, I, I think personally, I don't think that, uh, I, I, I think I've kind of been lucky enough to, I think, be in the place where from the very first music that I was doing, people kind of knew that that was where I stood. So I haven't, I haven't necessarily had the, the even opportunity to know what I would have lost, you know what I mean? Um, but what I would say, which I guess is just coming off the last point that he made is, there is still a, um, there's a real reckoning that has to happen around um, the fact that artists need funding in order to make work. Amen. And that funding um, is often comes with a lot of other things, whether it's through what they expect you to be a part of or to do or, or how they expect to have a say in your work, or whether that's just what the person who is funding you, or the corporation, rather, I should say, is funding you is a part of that you're not part of. But or the by, by being a part of that corporation, you're tacitly a part of it. You know, so right. that is something that I do think is not an easy question, and but is something that I think all artists should be wrestling with, yeah. um, especially in the, the era where you were talking about record labels. I don't. I, as a person of my age, I don't really live in the era of record no. labels. I live in the era of streaming, right. and I live in the era where oh, we're going to get the, to that. There are the new. These are the new corporations. So you know, people. There's ways in which the internet is very democratizing and makes space for people to, especially artists, to you know, to find, uh, to give their voice in the way that's unadulterated, and to find community to support that. But there's also I think a little bit of an, a lack of understanding in how corporations are corporations and they're still controlling artists. Go ahead, jump in, man. Well, go ahead, go ahead, man. It's liberating for whoever can afford to live on nothing and make a record for free. Right. You know, in other words, we're to, that, that I want to bring it back to the, bring it you know, back. not that the economics are the only thing, but if we're going to get intersectional, let's. That's got to be the in, one of the important intersections, because if we're looking for a guy to ride ride in on you know a horse with a KKK sheet on, mm -hmm. saying you can't say sing that, well okay maybe God forbid you know I hope that I hope we're not going to see that anywhere near here soon, but how about but every time but when we tell young musicians oh you know there's no I mean I came up like there was touring circuits for young musicians that we could make money on. You know, the so-called, if people wanted to go into jazz, the so-called Chitlin circuit. You know, I, my first real jazz gig was touring with Brother Jack McDuff. And it, it was hard in a lot of ways, but we, we got paid, I paid my rent. So right. young musicians today don't have that. They get told, sure, just make your own video and make, you know, make a bunch of tracks and then put them online and uh, you and eight the 80,000 other people who put them online this week, you know, if, if somebody noticed, if you, the, the, real, the reality, the myth is you put it online and you're reaching people. Reality is, is the ones who reach people are the ones who have seven grand to hire a publicist. Okay, you know, so, so nobody, people aren't, so let's talk about the repressive effects. Every time you raise the cost of getting, and so people get into the game now, they don't have those gigs like I had, like I was lucky to have. They have, they have uh, New England Conservatory or Juilliard. And, you know, 
so that's a $30,000, $40,000, $50,000 chip to get, you know, a, 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 a year to get in the game. And every time you raise the, the cost of, of putting your music out there, every time you tell people they can't get paid, you're excu excluding poor working class and black people, uh, and black people who are poor or working class. That's a major factor. And I, I actually want to, yeah, I kind of want to dive into that a little bit as well, but maybe in a slightly different way from the perspective of what I do and what I've tried to do for a long time, which is write about and be invested in some sense of culture in a way where I could tell your stories and connect dots and connect it to a readership and an audience in places where people could care about all this. I'm old enough to remember Ronald Reagan and the right having a war on culture. I don't hear anybody on the right waging a war on culture because I don't think we're even on their radar anymore as something that needs to be fought against. And But I want to talk really specifically, and this isn't about me or my work or my finances or my opportunity, but a decade ago, I could go to Cuba with Arturo Faro and write a long story that was as much about the politics of the relationship between these two nations and our shared identity as it was about his music, get paid fairly well, have it on the cover of a respected publication that had some real reach. Today, I do not have that opportunity there and anywhere else I would write, I'd get one-tenth the money and one-thirtieth the readership. Um, quite a number of years ago, I could write for the very same editor that I'm working for at the Wall Street Journal and write interview-based pieces, like I did about New Orleans after Katrina, that were as much about how the politics of that moment were best reflected through that culture and that music. Now, I love my editor. He still pays me what he paid me per word but I really am relegated to writing reviews of albums. And it's not because anyone's throttling my politics, it's because a digital media revolution has changed the nature of what these newspapers, magazines, and other media are. And yeah, there, to a certain level, there's a democratizing effect of the internet, but to another level, I can tell you that when someone comes to me and wants my content, I know what that means. <laughs> That's different than when my mom, they want my writing and my ideas. It, has a, it, it allows me to serve a different function, it generally pays differently, and it m basically means they want to hold someone's attention long enough to collect their data. And, but the practical effect of that is, I can't serve the function that I was serving. So I had a two-week engagement at a major university. There was a 20-year-old man who wanted to talk to me about jazz. I said, wait till after the class. This is a writing class. Came to me after the class. Oh, what are you listening to? Tells me he's listening to a Roy Hargrove album recorded in Cuba. I'm like, oh, Crisol, Habana? Wow, that's very cool. That album was recorded before you were born. How did you learn about that album? I don't know, Pandora, Spotify, one or the other. Great, I'm glad it delivered that to you. Um, do you know who Chucho Valdez is? No. Do you know who any of the other Cuban musicians on the album are? No. Spotify isn't going to tell him that. Do you know the story of how this young trumpeter who's died before his time went to Cuba and had his musical life changed by these masters? No. Do you know that there were liner notes who told you that story? No. Do you know who wrote those liner notes? No. I wrote those liner notes. Now, I don't care if he knows my name. I'm not going to get extra money for him reading those liner notes. But he is being denied that history. He's being denied even the knowledge that that history exists for him to access. And I'm so glad, Mark, you talked about being younger and studying who the side men are. Side, that, men. side people, forgive me. Yes, we um, who the other musicians are. Who's in the credits? That is how I constructed my history. That's how I learned why it's good to play with Jack DeJunet. Why is he popping up so much? This isn't just a little aside. This, this is, I feel like this is another, I know we didn't get to talk about it, but I know that Regina, you're involved in a project about how black communities were raised by the construction of interstates and 
history was erased. This is a different erasure of history for me. I mean, and I guess I'm throwing the question I would throw out. Do you feel like, do you feel like the current um, context for music, culture, writing, criticism relegates you more to an entertainment function than it has been in the past? Because I know people want me to write about entertainment now. I don't think it, it doesn't, no. I, I, I feel, I don't know, I, I still do what I do. It, and, but entertainment, I, for me, entertainment has always been, I don't want to play music at people. Right. You know, so enter, I want to entertain them. I've always wanted to be an entertainer. You know, I grew up watching Carol Burnett and right. all those, I tap danced and did all that stuff. So, inter, you know, I want to make it interesting. That's what entertainment means to me, is to make something interesting so people want to continue, want to come back and hear it or want to go hear someone else. So they want to leave their homes to go and witness something live and experience that. Mm -hmm. So I don't look at it, entertainment as a... I yeah, and I, I don't mean to make that a divide either, but I guess and, uh, what I'm saying is do you, do you feel like we are in any way losing or in danger of losing a larger sense of culture in this moment, in this media landscape? Hmm. That's, a, that's an interesting... I don't know, I can only talk about people my age, you know, uh, my... Right. I, I don't know. It's a, it's on one level, yes. When, sometimes when I go online and I see, you know, people will say, "Oh, you should go on uh, Facebook." There's this woman that eats in front of the camera, and she's got this many followers, and she's making this many millions of dollars. Yeah, in that in that sense, that's we are. It's like really, people, <laughs> you know. <laughs> um, and I, I think you know you're of the young you're of this generation so you know how to work this this to make it work for you you know I think as an artist and and I could learn from that so yeah am I just sounding old and out of touch here um, I don't know I mean <laughs> it's funny because I I know that I'm the 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 person of that generation on the panel but I'm probably of that generation. <laughs> the worst person to talk to about that. Yeah. <laughs> I hate social media. But, um, but uh, what I will say is I think, I think like everything, it's not a dialect, a dialect it's not a duality. Right. So it's, it's, there's things that we lose, but there's also things we gain. You know, I think, um, I think there, and, and both things have to be understood or held in two hands, you know? So it's hard to say it's one way. I, I would say one thing that I think is a beautiful thing is that there's a, it, it, the, the, the web has enabled sharing between countries in a way that's new and has a, and it also has given tools and enabled people who don't have the resources to have music lessons or to like, you know, because music is, is not in the schools anymore. So it's like, you know, everybody has the, the requisite tools now for the most part to make music. And I think, uh, and, and that music is being shared for instance, between Los Angeles and South Africa. And music that's new right. is coming from that connection. And I think that's really beautiful. Um, the, the things I'm more concerned with in terms of the internet don't really have to do with music. It's more about surveillance. Mm -hmm. And it's more about globalization and the effects of globalization on capitalism. The, I just want to make really clear, because when you start talking about the internet stuff, like people's eyes glaze over a little bit because it's like, ain't the horse out of the barn, you know, like, right. am I some kind of like, I'm not, I don't want to come off, I'm, if you're the worst person in your generation to talk about, I'm the worst person in mine, to, 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 <laughs> and that's saying a lot, you know, I, my daughter has to turn on the TV for me, but, <laughs> but, um, but, <laughs> I wish I was exaggerating, <laughs> but, um, uh, uh, I want to make clear that I'm not, you know, you're absolutely right. It's a dialectic, not a duality. But that said, to really look at it as a dialectic, you have to see what part of the, what dialectic it's part of. Um, first of all, the horse, I hope I wasn't interpreted as saying the internet is bad. 
you know, maybe it is, but whatever. Uh, there's very specific thing about the internet that is not working for musicians, and I do care about musicians because I am a musician and because I believe that political action has to start with me, my friends, my people who I'm working with. Now, maybe not the only place. I mean, acts of solidarity are cool, but we have to understand our own lives politically. So what's specifically bad about the internet is section 512 of the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. Thank you. Which says, um, which is insulates the major online corporations for responsibility for violating copyright. Mm -hmm. And this is, this is the deep politics of, of the internet. It's, not, it's all good, except they're, the big corporations did something genius. They created a system. They, like normal people like us, when we say, well, that's illegal, we say, well, oh, man, don't do that, or you're going to get caught. Big corporations, when they see something illegal, they don't say, oh, that's too bad. They say, oh, great. Right. No, no, they don't even, they did something even more brilliant than that. They transferred the, the legal conflict into a political area where they couldn't, where it was impossible to enforce the law. So violating copyright, stealing my stuff is still illegal, but the law says that the only ones I can take to court are the individual violator. So by the time they had 120 million people, right. 150 million people online, it was no longer politically viable to, to enforce that law. What, are you gonna arrest grandma? Well, I mean, uh, my, sorry, I'm not gonna say anything about my relatives, but uh, uh, <laughs> may they rest in peace. But uh, um, no, <laughs> I will later on. So in other words, it was, a, it was a political strategy to get around the law by transferring, the Section 512 says you can't, it insulates, uh, Google, YouTube, from any legal responsibility, even though they make billions, right. billions, hundreds of billions. Their parent corporation, Alphabet, is worth $1.2 trillion, and of a, lo a lot of it, if we want to talk about empowerment and disempowerment, a lot of that money came from, from uh, data mining, the data mining and ad brokerage and ad sales on our work. Yes. So, you know, that's, yeah. that's how disempowerment and, yeah. is being affected. And I, I also don't want to pine for a distant past or speak against digital media or internet, but I do, I think we want to raise the, the area of law that Mark is talking about is an active area of law and legislation that is being discussed and can be researched and spoken about. And, you know, I just want to raise some consciousness that, hey, Spotify and Pandora and streaming services do a lot of great things, but the same way you might think about whether you're going to get a plastic bag at the store and what that means, well, how much is the artist getting compensated for this music compared to how they used to get compensated? And maybe if we all demanded the liner notes and the context, the data files, maybe someone could hear that. Um, I think it's past time that we open things up to questions. If you have questions, there are two ways that works. One is you get up to this microphone. The other is it's just like Jeopardy. Phrase your answer in the form of a question. Um, so please, no speeches, but please questions for any or all, or all of our panelists. Well, when you speak about speaking truth to power, what I hear here underneath is really the humanity of people. We're trying to not just be, get the public, and we want to get the public awake to people who are suffering in our prisons. We have a program called Music on the Inside, working with Winton, and it was inspired by Louis Armstrong. So just directly working with the population is so gratifying and so important, rather than just only going to the public, but also to get the public to wake up to that whole population of people that have been forgotten. So I think it's a very important subject, and not just to be, in a sense, in an angry way, speaking truth to power, but really finding our common humanity. That's just what I feel is important. Thanks. Um, do you have a question for our panelists? I just or, like I wanted to address the okay. population rather than just 
uh, how do we get it out there, who are we getting out there for? That's kind of, it's a question that I have. Mm -hmm. I don't know how to ask it better than that. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Kendall Thomas. I'm the Nash Professor of Law at mm -hmm. Columbia University and the director of the Center for the Study of Law and Culture. Uh, my question is specifically a question about how jazz or music or the arts more generally can be used um, as a political tool to educate people. Um, after the, the Nevada Republican primary, then candidate Donald Trump said famously, I love the poorly um, educated. And Trump's <laughs> success has to do in some great measure with the fact that not just music in schools, but education in schools uh, for many people, um, the people you care about, uh, has deteriorated so dramatically over the course of the last three decades. Um, the, the, the late British, black British writer, uh, Stuart Hall once said that things can be, can be said in the arts that can't be said mm -hmm. any other way. And so as you reflect um, on the cultural and intellectual and, and political resource that jazz and the arts more broadly are, what do you see as your responsibility um, as artists to co-participate and collaborate uh, with others in educating publics to increase uh, literacy and to use the arts not just as a, a platform um, and a tool and a venue um, and an arena, uh, but as a life world for inviting people to see themselves and to imagine themselves in what used to be called our democracy in, in, a, in a, do, a different, larger, um, and um, um, more democratic way. Sure, man. Going into schools, taking this music into schools, and not only just the music, but I think what the, the, the message that the music has, um, taking it to the people, taking it to communities, because there are a lot of people that maybe A, in the community can't afford to come to some of these big halls, but a lot of times they feel left out or feel like that's a world that they're not allowed in. They feel uncomfortable sometimes. And so um, I know, I think we all have gone into schools, um, you know, performing for or working with children. Um, I go into nursing homes uh, and, and play in hospitals and hospice. I do a lot of hospice work, but it's just taking it, taking it to the people and not just as a form of, of entertainment, but using it as a tool of education as well. I was so shocked, I guess I'm just way behind. I didn't realize that civics was not taught in schools anymore. Uh -huh. So that's a huge, and a lot of this I feel like is by design. Anyone um, wanna jump in, yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I would just say I appreciate the question and I do think that um, for me, music has always been that, not just uh, you know, in terms of information, but in terms of the will to act. I think, you know, growing up, listening to an artist and like Regina Carter, just taking that opportunity to shout her out, you know, she was foundational in terms of, uh, you know, among other artists, like showing me what could actually happen within the space of making music and being able to think, to, to get people to think differently or to consider other ways or even just to imagine in other ways. So I just want to say that's something I, I learned from her among other people. Um, I think what I wrote down in, in terms of your question that I'm considering right now is how to not just, um, how to not just increase and, and you know, work to support uh, better educational systems, particularly public educational systems, because there's also, we're dealing with the privatization of education, which is a part of that. Mm -hmm. But it's also how to transform it, because I think this is an opportunity to not just look at what we need, how we need to educate folks, but also the ways in which our, our traditional education systems have st also still been skewed, you know, and how they, they have not, um, both in terms of the ways that people learn, but also in terms of the information that we're getting, 
it's still reinforcing white supremacy. It's still reinforcing mm -hmm. patriarchy. It's still reinforcing a, a fantastical version of history that we know is not real. So as we're yeah. taking this opportunity to hopefully deal with these things that are real about how we're not being educated, the, you know, given the education we deserve as young people, it's also an opportunity to talk about how to do it a different way. I want to seize on that very quickly, that question, and really relates to what you were saying before that too, but especially schools. My son's 11, he's in sixth grade, he's in a very well-endowed school, public school, but I get uncomfortable when people talk about, hey, if they study piano, they'll get into medical school more easily. <laughs> I get uncomfortable when we've stuck a, an A for arts into STEM, for math and sciences, and now it's STEAM, because that can work in that curriculum too. I really do think that culture and arts is what kids can learn to become the kind of citizenry and human being we want, if people are gonna organize and have some semblance of voting with a conscience and a purpose, yes, if they learn arts and they experience culture, that's gonna make them a different kind of citizen and have a different point of view. And I worry that it's becoming a subject. And also I wanna just add on to that is, is, is seeing who's teaching who's teaching about the hit, this history and the music, because yeah. some people um, eliminate very important parts of the history, mm. and it's being, re, it's been, being rewritten right. and taught, and a lot of people are being left out. So that's something to be very, you have to be Stuff ready. like, where did a banjo come from? <laughs> <laughs> so Sorry, I'll be really brief. Um, I, I hope that this answer doesn't disappoint you because I, I feel as a human being, you know, a moral, you know, uh, I have a moral responsibility like every other human being to help other people, to, to do good things and to help those in need of help. But as a musician, I'm a little, I want, I have to be a little wary of the of the idea of a special obligation musicians mm -hmm. of of engagement i want i my engagement is like my obligation as a musician is to rock the house and pay my union dues in my opinion and um and yeah that that's what i feel my obligation is as a mu and i think that there may be we could get in a long discussion about maybe there's something like i said at the beginning of the conversation at different moments, in order to rock the house, there may be certain political things that you need to do, but I'm a little hesitant to go into the area of, of engagé, you know, a la 1930s, the engaged artists, all, uh, you know, and, and that has a kind of funny history of itself. I do think there's one very important wet thing that musicians can do, and, and I'm gonna be very brief about this, but. Musicians work, our work, we think of it as something apart, but it's, in fact, we, musicians are the shock troops for post-Fordism. Musicians were the shock, they, they don't call it the gig economy for nothing. The way we work, which 60 years ago, 70 years ago, was just us and merchant marines using that word gig, is now the way tens of millions of people work. And so we have a power, because not only were we first, unfortunately, forced into a certain economic model, but we represent that model to the larger world. People, when, the, you know, when somebody is working for a dot-com startup and they're working uh, 90 hours a week and their boss is yelling, what, you think you're, this isn't IBM? Get back to work, you know? They, they think, yeah, we're like musicians, like, you know, <laughs> like some jazz musician working, you know, staying in the studio all night to get that thing right. We are the model. We are the, the poster boys for this new way, new forms of exploitation. So what we can do to, to stop that, how we, if we manage to organize ourselves um, in the face of that, we can create models of organizing that I think will be will have a bigger effect than just us. Um, 
We actually do have a clock on the wall, so the fourth quarter's over, and I'm told there is no overtime. But it warms my heart that you have more questions, and maybe as we leave in the hall, we can continue the conversation. I do want you to all continue these conversations in your lives. It warms my heart that you want to sit here for an hour or so and talk about this stuff, and it humbles me to be in the presence of such wonderful, talented, and generous artists, so please help me thank them.